wander in when they come. But it's now my pleasure to introduce Maureen Butler. Oh my goodness, when I first met Maureen, I said, what, okay, she said, can you help me? And I said, I don't know, what do you need help with? She goes, I got a problem with Prozac. <laughs> I said, uh, okay, we'll need to get, a anyway, that's, that's pretty much Maureen. Those of you who know her, like, she's like clear, direct, to the point, and like pins you the minute she, you know, can you do this if you can't? Well, then, you know. She's the only person I've ever known been released to actually construct part of the prison. She's the only, uh, uh, sorry. You're okay with that now? Uh, no, but this, <laughs> I'm okay with you being constructing, but I know you're going to use all those skills to help us build those tiny houses. So, right. yeah, darn right. So there darn we go. Right. Darn no right. right. No swearing. No swearing. Um, but seriously, Maureen has uh, made all kinds of firsts before she ever came to prison. Was um, you know had was in non-traditional uh -huh. trades before many women even envisioned what that might look like. Was doing all kinds of. Um, what are you making face? Okay, w when the regional advocates from EFRI start making faces at you when you're up here, it's a little disconcerting, and I'm going to come back and and smile at you. No, <laughs> so no, it's um, so Maureen since uh, you know was serving a life sentence, and since then has gone on to do all kinds of things, including um, a position that has now been made defunct by the Correctional Service of Canada. She was a lifeline worker. A lifeline worker, for some of you who are new to this um, concept, was the hiring of individuals who were serving life sentences to go back in and advocate with and on behalf of people serving life sentences in prison. And uh, there were very few women who were ever hired to be lifeline workers, and I'm quite comfortable in saying Maureen was amongst that fine group of women who would go in and were sometimes tasked with very difficult tasks of uh, or challenges of actually having to advocate in very increasingly hostile situations and so much so that, bless you, that eventually they, bless you again, um, and that they uh, did away with the positions and really um, did a complete disservice to themselves because these were a group of individuals who were both role models, mentors. Yes, they were advocates, but most importantly, they created incredible hope for those serving life sentences. And for those of you who don't know what a life sentence is, I'm not going to begin to describe it, but let's just suffice to say that the new bill that was introduced that is um, being, um, the re rhetoric around it is that it's life means life really is a life means death bill um, because life already means life. And with that, I will pass it over to Maureen who you were going to demonstrate something about that, right? I was. <clears throat> Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I'd like to do that big thing of what, that I'm on the nation's land and all of that, but I don't, I'm not capable of doing that at the moment, but I promise I'll get that down packed. And I'm, but I'm honored. Um, the other day there, I was sitting there, um, I've come to a couple of conferences. There's been a few that's really affected me. Um, this, um, the confinement one and, and trying to get segregation removed um, in Winnipeg a couple of years ago really had a, a pr profound effect on me. I'm a little different than your average prisoner. Um, I walked into prison for women, very, very scared. Um, I walked in with, um, well, the, um, the 1994 riot had just begun. My father said to me on the phone, that's what they do to you women, so be careful. Um, I come from a construction industry. I moved up north. I went into the mine. I fought the mine. Um, I've pioneered for women. I'm an advocate not even knowing it. I've been told this over and over and over again. I just thought I was a, a really stupid individual, but I guess uh, I'm, I'm learning that um, it took a lot of courage for the things that I've done. Um, I always said um, I might have... Um, I might have won the battle, but I sure the hell lost the war. But uh, <clears throat> I'm, once again, I'm, I'm in front of an amazing um, group of individuals, again, that advocate. Um, when I was doing it, I was alone. I didn't know who to reach out to, and so on and so forth. Um, I now have a really wonderful support group, and I can see that amongst us here, we, we fight for, for the rights of, of individuals. I'm still more towards the women, not so much towards the men. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but um, so anyways, Kim had made mention yesterday that um, there were some women here that are actually right out of the institution. I've been out of the institution since 2002. And um, I do a few speaking engagements. I'm not a professional at it by any means, and I'm not a circuit speaker. 
I did a speak to young offenders one time. There was two of them. I've never done that before. I usually speak to adults. And uh, once again, a profound effect. I probably don't ever want to do it again. I just wanted to take them home and make cookies with them and, you know, the big bad killer. Let's go home and make cookies, right? But uh, it was just incredible. So I was pretty shooken up over this. It was my first time ever speaking to these young ones. And I'm driving out of Hamilton and I'm on my phone against the law because just because I have a life sentence doesn't mean I don't break the law. <laughs> I just try better not to get caught now when I'm not really out there. Um, so I'm on the phone and I look in my you're rear in view. You're in park because it's on yes. video stream. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm on you're the on parole. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes you forget these things. Yeah. But you're always reminded and that's, a, that's something that I'm just going to give you an mm. idea of where you can get comfortable and then I'm going to take you to a place where fear starts to rule my life again. So I'm driving along and I'm doing what m most people do I'm on the average day and I'm, I'm still thinking about that girl and I'm probably reaching out for the best part for some support and I look in the rear view mirror mirrors and I see the lights go on. And I'm like, oh my God, I got busted for the phone. So I throw the phone and he pulls me over and he comes up to the, the, the vehicle and he says, oh, I guess I have to see your driver's license and, no, first of all, he says to me, he said, uh, I ran your plate and you're, 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 you're an inmate. And I said, uh, no, I'm not an inmate. So I know at this point, oh, oh, I'm in big trouble because he doesn't know who I am and he doesn't know what the rules and regulations are. So he says, I think I'll need your driver's license and your ownership, so I reach over and I get that. And at the same time, I'm sitting as still as possible because I'm going, oh my God, if he's ran me, which he had, I come up a second degree murder and I used a 12 gauge shotgun. So you kind of go, I wonder if he thinks I have a gun. So he says, he's standing there and I have to do this. And this is what I said to Kim. I said, you know, people don't understand what we go through. He wants my driver, driver's license, but he also has to have, have my ownership. He needs this, he needs this, he needs this, he needs this, and this. And then I have to dig one more time because I'd heavenly for forbid ever to lose this. So I'm digging and I'm just, I'm shaking. Oh. Sometimes I forget where I put it. And then I reach into this little thing because this is really important and I have to give him this. And he's going, oh. And I said, well, that's what I have to do when you pull me over. And can I give you my parole officer's card, please, too? Because now I'm really scared. So he takes it to his car and I'm just praying, going, please, please know what you can do with this brand new Bill C. Um, what was it? Bill C-10 where it gives the police the, the ability to arrest me on the spot without calling a parole officer or anything and I'm crapping myself. He comes back with all of this and he's shaking, I'm shaking and we're looking at each other and he's got my driver's license and my ownership and I'm thinking, oh my God. And he goes, I am so sorry for pulling you over. And I'm going, okay. Can I go now, please? So I don't tell my parole officer, because that's the next step I have to do, is I have to call my parole officer and tell her I've been pulled over. And I told her, and I don't mean to be rude or anything, I didn't tell her for a couple of days, and then somehow it slipped out. And she said, Maureen, you're supposed to tell me. And I said, at what point do I tell you when my asshole lets go or what? Because I still, at this point, wasn't through the trauma that I had faced with that gentleman not knowing what he was going to do with all of these papers and who I was. Because on his computer, it said that I was still in prison and I had no business being out. People don't understand what a life sentence is. I don't know for anybody in the room what that means. I know when I was, when I stood before the judge, when I stood before the judge and my lawyer said to me, Maureen, take this deal. I was 18 months just after the crime I probably couldn't have spelt my name. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know why the crime happened. And all I wanted to do was somebody to help me. And I really relied on this lawyer to help me. And he said, look, just take the deal. 
it's life 11, you'll be out in four years if you're on good behavior. And I looked at my mom and dad and I said, and they said, we don't, we don't know what to say, Maureen, it's up to you. And I was 28 years old. I thought the deal was good. I didn't know. And I signed the deal. I didn't realize that for the rest of my natural life that I'd be carrying these papers subject to a police officer, a, a parole officer. I just got another one. I've only had like, I don't know, I can't even count them. I just had an acting one that decided that she didn't want to do a community assessment to allow me to see some man that I, was gotten, that I had gotten involved with that was a business owner that was a upstanding citizen. And she made the decision that I'm not allowed to see him. And I made the decision that I was gonna insist on seeing him and that she needs to spend her three months and 29 days and go back to being a copper and leave my life alone because I've been out since 2002 and don't you know, I've earned my right. But yet corrections at the same time reminds me this is what you've earned, Maureen. It's not a right, it's a privilege. You're on life parole and you will be for the rest of your life. Okay, I'm good with that, right? So I do Lifeline and I advocate for women and I go back into the institutions and I tell these women, don't stop at McDonald's. Go big, strive hard, rub elbows with the right people, people in this room, and you'll be able to get where Maybe I've got to or whatever. You don't have to stop at McDonald's. And they say, yeah, Maureen, yeah, and you give them hope. So I decide to go back to school. And so I get back to school, and in order to do a placement, you need to get a vulnerability sector check or you need to get a criminal background check. So I call my parole officer again, and I'm like, I need a criminal background check. And she's like, you just stay away from the police station. Because mm -hmm. she, too, doesn't know what they're capable of doing. And they know I'm in the community, they just don't know what I look like, and they really kind of leave me alone, because they don't really know. Like, we don't need to let everybody know. But I need this, this, this here thing to go to school, to get a placement. She prints me off when it's not good enough. I have to go and talk to the school department and make a special thing to speak to the, the head of the department. And she's like, oh, just a criminal record, you know, a blemish. Blemish, this is my blemish. And I show her my CPEC that says second degree murder. Oh, it never stops, right? It, it just, ne it never stops. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. So I say to the women to continue to fight this fight, but I forget that this fight consists of what you have to produce all this identification and, and put yourself out there when you're as raw as no, like you're possibly, okay, I'm gone. I don't know where I went. Okay, do you want me to pick up for a minute? Yep, pick up. Okay. So I, I left. You did very well. It's very hard to talk about your life and expose yourself to an entire group, and it takes a lot of courage. So oh, yeah. thank you for doing that. So I'm just going to run through a bit how Maureen got here, the process part, for those of you who don't know the process. Some of you know it well in this room uh, because you've lived it yourself, but others don't. So to come, uh, so what, shall we start first with applying for parole? So the minute you are sentenced, many lawyers don't know what the sentence actually means. They'll say, oh yeah, life, you'll be out in four years. They'll look at, they'll, or they'll say, if they actually know, they'll say you'll be able to, um, be eligible to apply three years before you'll, your 11 year date. So at eight years, you'll be able to apply for parole. If they know that, many don't even know that. They just think it's automatic. Oh yeah, you get to that point and you get out. What does life mean? Well, they've been, 25. they've heard that. Yeah, well life, in life does mean 25. Now it actually means multiples of 25 um, and 35 and up. But at the time you were sentenced, it meant life 25. It meant at the um, eight year mark, you're eligible to apply for passes and day parole. It means at the 11 year mark, you're eligible to apply for full parole. It doesn't mean you get it. In fact, most people don't get parole on their eligibility dates. Contrary to the rhetoric you hear, most people don't. And increasingly, the parole board has become a, t a detention body, not a releasing body, which is what it was set up to be. It was set up because of recognition. All the research in the world shows that the best way to release someone into the community it is in a structured, supervised way if they have any risk to pose. If they have no risk to pose, you should just release them. But the law doesn't allow that. So 
um, to get out, someone has to, a lifer has to apply for parole. They have to go before the parole board. If you're serving life 25, you actually used to have an ability to apply for a judicial review at 15 years. That's what Yvonne was talking about. In Yvonne, Yvonne's case, the application goes in. Now, there's a very limited scope and you have to apply very quickly. You have to, um, and when you apply, it goes to the Chief Justice in the province where you were sentenced. The Chief Justice has to look at your case and say, hmm, do you think, do you think this merits sending it to a jury to consider whether this person should be eligible for parole? In Yvonne's case, Yvonne, should we send it? And the Chief Justice then decides, should we send it? If they say yes, then it goes to the jurisdiction where you were sentenced. And you may have remember I said earlier that in Yvonne's case, she's the only one, woman who we've managed to get a change of venue in that situation, arguing the racism of the sentencing court that dealt with her. Can you look at it again? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, and in Yvonne's case, she was able, she um, applied for and and got that judicial review. You then go before a jury uh, um, in the community where you were sentenced, or in Yvonne's case, in Edmonton. I'm just introducing the process of applying Yvonne for getting out. And then, um, then, and only then, if the jury determines, one, you are deserving of being able to apply for parole before the 25-year mark, or if you were serving 15 years or less before that, um, if the jury decides you're deserving of being able to apply, they'll say, yes, you can apply. And then they have to make a decision, at what stage can you apply? Are you immediately eligible? Are you eligible in two years, and three years, and whatever, up to the, your, the time you would be eligible? If they determine that you are eligible, it still doesn't stop there. Then they set, write up the decision, send it back, and then you have to apply to the parole board and do the process that M Maureen did. And then both Maureen and um, Yvonne have had to then apply to the parole board to go before the parole board to have their, um, all their paperwork put forth to determine whether in fact they're eligible to be released to the community. And then once they're deemed to be eligible to be released to the community by the parole board, they can be released, but they first have to have an assess a community assessment of where they want to go. And they can't just go anywhere, they can't just go home, contrary to, again, what you'd hear if you just read the media reports, and not because the, because the media is told the incorrect information as well. Uh, but then they do a community assessment to determine whether you can go first on passes and then um, later to determine where you can go and you have to go into a halfway house. Usually on day parole, you have to go into um, a halfway house. If you're Aboriginal, you can apply for what's called a Section 84 release, which means you can go into an in Aboriginal community and serve your sentence there. Very few people get them and increasingly they're setting up contracts um, for what are essentially halfway houses and calling them Section 84 agreements. And then once you're in the halfway house, you have to apply to eventually get full parole to go out into the community, and it's still not finished. So to come here, both Yvonne and Maureen had to apply for a travel permit. And for that travel permit, they have to say where they're going, because when you're on parole, what's your, what's your circumference, your radius? 40 kilometers. So, 40 kilometers from where Maureen lives is where she can go. So just think in your own mind of what your life, what you do and what you'd like to do. Every time you want to go outside of that radius, you have to apply to the, your parole officer. And if sometimes the parole officer will take it to the parole board, sometimes they'll exercise their discretion and allow you to. Um, if all the police. You have to notify all the police um, in the jurisdictions where you're going. What's your radius, Yvonne? Or here or there? 80, 80 kilometers. So, so you have 80 kilometers. Um, so Yvonne has to, if she's wanting to go, so that doesn't even allow you to go visit your family, either of you. You have to apply to go see your family. To come here, um, they do a community assessment of, they, I get contacted. <laughs> um, and I've never been challenged yet, but um, you know they could essentially come and do a full assessment of me. I'd love them. I really want them. Actually, I'm saying that to the camera. I'd really love you to come do a full assessment of me. I've been waiting for that. Um, would usually, that lady in the radio save you? Have you ever had Lisa? Would you have Lisa even in your kitchen? Sorry. Remember that? Was there? Oh yeah. That's hilarious. So, um, 
But the reality is I, I have had, yes, many people live in my home and stay in my home and visit my home. And, but the reality is that to do that, there's a community assessment done of the person who is inviting you. They have to be t checked out. Um, they are, if they don't know, they are told why you were in jail. So if you have new friends that you, and we have a woman who um, developed a friendship and she was invited to go visit that friend and she didn't want to have to disclose to everybody she would meet, but that was a requirement. So she didn't, that new friend is no longer her new friend because she felt that her new friend didn't want to come visit her. Uh, and you know, how do you say to someone who is a new friend and you'd like to get to know them more, but that means you have to fully disclose all of these, these materials when you don't know what the relationship may end up being. If you are a woman, um, you have to disclose every, almost, well, not every woman has it, but almost every woman has disclosure of relationships. Now, what relevance does it have, your relationship, especially if, even if you're in for killing an abusive partner? What relationship, what does your relationship have to do with your risk to the community as a whole? And yet, um, when I asked recently through access to information, for all of the, num the numbers of women versus the numbers of men who have relationship conditions, my, the response was upheld by the Information and Privacy Commissioners, incidentally, was that the Correctional Service of Canada and the National Parole, or the Parole Board of Canada, did not have to disclose that information because it was so hard to find, there were so many, that it would take years for them to do that work. I offered to still pay them, I'm getting you know, the university's got good money coming to caves for me to do these gigs. <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit joking. Um, but the, um, so the, re <laughs> sorry. So the, um, the reality is that they indicated so many women had those conditions. And so we're in the process now trying to figure out how to get more of that information because they should be challenged. And I will now pass it. Have you regained your composure? I've regained my composure. Excellent plan. Back to you guys. Um, just two things. Um, so a relationship consists of if you meet somebody that you have to you have to let them know. Sorry. I, don't, I, don't, I could better scream that out than anything. Okay, so so you, most times I try not to tell them, and I know once again I'm breaking the law, but most you're times not, I no, you're not. Okay, I'm not on depends, camera. Okay, depends when the relationship, what who defines the relationship and how it's defined, and and yeah. part of the confusion is what is a relationship. So I don't have that stipulation anyways. I have one stipulation left on my, on, on my condition, and that's not to drink. I choose not to drink because I choose not to drink. I'm 22 years sober. I choose not to drink, but they yeah. insist on keeping it on there. And in order to keep it on there, that means I have to see my parole officer every, every two months. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky that I don't have to see her every week, but the minute I move jurisdictions, if, I, if, if they allow me to move jurisdictions, you mean move outside my 40 kilometer radius. If I move outside my 40 kilometer radius and set up home over there, then I get a brand new, pro it's possible that I get a brand new parole officer that wants me to urinate in a bottle and then meet her once a week for the next two months so she can get to know me and better assess me. And this has been going on since the day I came into. I have a file since 1993. It's not hard to read. You can read my file. It's, it's not a big file. It doesn't take much time. But she would want me to meet with her and, and, like I said, urinate in the bottle to make sure that I'm clean and sober. So relationships are something that I had just went through. Um, like I said, with the acting parole officer that, that has known me from being um, a lifeline worker in the institution, I've sat in front of the Parole Board of Canada, I've uh, assisted women, I've represented women to the Parole Board of Canada, and I have a correctional officer that makes a decision in my life that has absolutely um, put what I would say is, 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 is my character with corrections, a pretty good character. I mean, I go back into the institution, I work with women, I do ETAs, I drive their vehicles. And I have a correctional officer that acts as a parole officer that decides that I'm not, or he's not worthy to date me and I'm not worthy to date him and that we're not allowed to meet each other unless we're in public. Well, 
And so I gave Kim a call, but I gave Kim a call. Kim said, get it in writing. Well, you don't get anything in writing from corrections except stuff like this. Uh, you just don't. I don't know what that trip's all about, but it, I guess it was mentioned today about the law, the law within the law that's really not a law because they don't really, they have all these rules, but they can't, they can't put them on paper, but they can put these things on paper. They can, they can tell me about my 40 kilometer radius and so on and so forth. Um, so, why did she think you should name? Did, did she say? They don't give you that. Because okay. she wants to be a. Oh, would you want to know my take on it? If she wants to be a parole officer and she wants to go up the chain of ladder and she's going to step on my back to do it, I don't really like that. <laughs> mm. uh, so I asked for policies because that's what. So I said to Kim, "What do I do?" And she says, "Get the policy." Well, they don't give you the policy, but but they. But at the same time, you're gambling whether you're going back. So, so I was a happy, content individual going into the institution, pulling the women, pushing the women out as much as I possibly can, empowering them. She sits on front control now, the same officer that did this to me that I did back to her. And now I'm scared to go back into the institution because she has the right to, now she can drug scan me in the institution and she's got the locker key that I put my belongings in and I'm going, look, I don't even want to go back into that institution because now there's, there's always been a power imbalance, but now I've caused trouble with somebody that, well, I made it personal. I don't know what she did. I made it personal, and I probably shouldn't have, but um, there, was, and there was one more thing. So also with work as well, also with work as well, if you end up with a wrong parole officer, you'll be doing your job and the next thing you know, they walk into your employment and announce who they are and tell everybody there about you. And I got something in the mail one time and I was just livid. They sent it to the marina that I was working at at the time and it came in a great big manila envelope stamped CSC with my name across it. And I couldn't believe it. I thought, oh, my God, do you, do you need to tell everybody? Kim also mentioned about, about, about who needs to know. Um, I'm just going through something right now with a woman that's coming out that wants to rent um, a, 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 the, the first floor of a house. But who lives in the basement is other people that r rent rooms. And in order for that woman to move out and get to that first floor apartment, the parole officer has to go and interview and tell the people that live in that house, complete strangers. So mm. she's, no, she's no further ahead by coming out and trying to get her place that somebody is willing to give to her for probably half the price, but at the same time, she's going to be outed just like that. So now, like Kim was saying, um, anytime we go anywhere, I'm not too sure how it works out here out west, but if I want to stay overnight with my partner, they need to do a community assessment and tell me whether they deem him fit and whether does he know about me. So um, one of my biggest fears coming out was, I guess I just, just tell everybody, like I have struggled with that anyways, I need to tell everybody what I did because of who I am and they need to know and people were telling me, why do you need to tell everybody? So I worked really diligently on not telling everybody but then realized that I'm going to be told on anyways because my parole officer, anybody that I want to become close to, my parole officer is going to tell on me anyways. So, I don't know, I don't, maybe it's different out west, I don't know, do you, you don't carry on? Are that they ask you for a, get the microphone. When you were saying that you wanted to go stay with your mate, is it, is that your mate within your jurisdiction or outside your jurisdiction? Within the jurisdiction. No, that my PO, a lot of it falls down to your parole officer and what it was that you, or how far your parole officer wants to push it. I have a really good parole officer. Uh, the process with her is, I used to have to report to the RCMP once a month when I first got out. 
Then I had to see the parole officer uh, twice a month, and then it got down to once a month, and now I'm at the stage where I see her once every two months, unless any developments come up that would change that. I'm restricted to a 80 kilometer radius from the outskirts of the city limit. So from where I am in Calgary, I can go as far as Bray Creek in a circular around Calgary. Anything beyond that, then I can be just unlawfully at large in a place where you're not supposed to be and they can automatically pull you back in where if they pull you back in the process, due process that they put you through can take up to five years. Like if, uh, if RCMP got a wild hair up their butt and when you get pulled over by the police for anything minor or if they even want to approach you, they said by law, you got to show them who you are and where you're from and that you're a lifer on parole. Then it has restrictions on there. And my restrictions are not to hang around with known felons or participating outlaws. And I kind of told them at the beginning of that, I says, before I went up for parole, I says, can you actually really put that on me when everybody in my family has got a criminal record? Every single person, maybe minus one sister, has got some form of a criminal record, but then also goes into being native. It just is an automatic one point or another in your life. But then, uh, National Parole Board mandated the parole officers to do their job, in my case. They took it very, very personal with me. They made it a personal issue that the government and all their powers that be was going to make sure that I absolutely would abide by the law and even some laws that they may create in the meantime. And then they did a, a media kind of thing to back up what they were doing. So they were using me, I being like a poster child for profiting off a of crime because of the writing of my book which they never did ever take me to court and have it deemed an actual factual document that is strictly and solely and absolutely based on my offense. And that I actually did it with the realization that this was gonna sell 100 million copies and that I was gonna make a million bucks and that I was actually gonna make a profit off of my crime. So there was, I was used incognito as that and that's what they do is they'll handpick certain people to deal with in a different way. Like probably how they dealt with you is right down to the points of law unless they can find something descriptive to their advantage to use against you, which is probably like with most women that are of the same sex, they use that against them in their relationships. They look at it as a defectiveness of mental capacity or whatever. Uh, with her case, it was the dangerous offender, I believe. In my case, it was because I wrote the book. And so they, they pick on certain things that would promote their agenda and pushing something forwards. To the point where I went up for my 15 year review, it's supposed to be laws and points of laws that's gonna reflect on your file since incarceration of the likelihood or the probability that you are a risk to society or whatever. And I kind of got sidetracked to what I was intending to say there. But uh, I'm not freaking out this morning when you guys are talking about the pro board. I could not believe this pro board. I had no, no idea they, they have victims and these people can count, these people come yeah. and these people can't come and at least the rest of your life, you should have the right to have a billion people if you'd like to have to pray through a poll here. Like, so, sorry, can we go ahead? Sorry. No, no. Sorry to interrupt, Lisa. So, um, I don't know how many people know what that process is. So, those of you who have been through it clearly know what it is. But now, if you apply to go before the parole board, um, a bunch of things happen. It's almost automatic that whoever is identified as the victim or victims 
and they can self-identify as well. So in the case of someone who's been killed, obviously the person who's killed can't come to the parole board hearing, but it means that many people who are in that circle can and do claim to be victims and then are entitled to know now even have access to psychological reports. That will be challenged and I think that will be ultimately successful. But the reality is now um, people who uh, can come in and even though they're not supposed to influence that decision, the reality, reality is I can tell you um, almost every person, man or woman, who goes to a parole hearing and has a victim there, um, there are limits. Unless the, the individual's there, and sometimes they are advocating for the person's release, that those views will be taken into account. Now, I'm not suggesting victims don't have roles, but ours is an adversarial system built on the notion that a victim is, their evidence is only valid to show that you have broken a law. Now, I'm not saying you should agree with it or not agree with it, but that is what the role of a victim is in our current system. The, you're, you're charged with breaking a law which is a standard of behavior, or it's the standard of behavior that we call a law that says, and the victim's role is evidence that you're, you've done that, right? So that's the role of a victim in our criminal justice system. Um, that, that's an adversarial system. What we have done is tr instead of really addressing the issues that would prevent people from being victimized, in my opinion, like setting up supports, and instead of setting up supports after someone's been victimized to assist them to deal with the trauma and deal with other issues. Um, there have been at the pretext of assisting victims by saying, well, you know, by sometimes lo lobby groups who uh, you know, often fronted by police lobby groups and others who have gone in and said, we'll go to people when they're in horrible stages of grief sometimes, if they've lost a loved one, and we'll suggest to them these are some of the ways that you might get justice. I don't know a victim yet who would say, that the longer and longer sentence was actually what helped them achieve justice. Most of them want some recompense, some support, some assistance. Um, if they've lost a loved one, there's nothing that will bring that person back. Uh, but they, you know, they may want some things. They're enticed to believe through everything from victim participation, victim impact statements, that somehow that will deal with and help them heal. The reality is that often doesn't help. In the parole board context, what it has meant is that since we've seen victim involvement in parole board hearings, the rates of release have gone down. Now, it's also um, related to changes in the law, changes to policy, um, changes in who gets appointed to parole boards, absolutely. But they run in tandem, and what we're seeing is far lower release rates, more conditions, and things like this. So how do you define what is a relationship? As what I was at a parole board hearing at Grand Valley Institution on December 23rd, the woman was being breached. It was a same-sex relationship. The woman was being breached because she hadn't declared a relationship. She said, I don't know if it's a relationship yet. When does it become a relationship? And I'll, I'll put it as bluntly as she did. When we fuck? Is that when it's a relationship? Is it when a relationship when I decide I like her and we go for coffee? And it was, it was so unclear. Some parole officers would say, well, you know, when you meet someone, you don't know it's going to be a relationship. If you meet someone and have a one-night stand, imagine in your own life, if you had to justify to everybody in your life, every person that you got involved with, one night, maybe longer than that, maybe someone you met for coffee, never, and every person you had to declare to everybody in your circle that this is, you know, you've just decided to engage with that individual. And then someone who doesn't even know you has the power to scrutinize that and determine for you whether it's an appropriate relationship. That's what happens, and increasingly so yeah. on parole, and that's what has been You know what I was talking about, too, Kim, is the changes in the criminal justice system in regards to the Dangerous Offender Act and women now, and it is becoming more, sorry, Monty has a, oh, thanks, Monty. I would like to discuss the, the change of the criminal justice system where when I went for my Dangerous Offender hearing, I was the second woman to be declared and the only woman to get the indeterminate sentence. And now it's being used like, how many, how many are there, Kim? There are two right now, but there are two more under. Review. Yeah, so I mean, I just think that with the criminal justice system, that's fine. You know, you commit an offense, you go to court, you get found guilty, you go to jail. The agency find you get arrested, go to court, get sentenced, and have your sentence expires your natural time of death. That's, you have no, 
I just think that for these women and for me, like I had Kim to walk me through it, thank God, for t my appeal and stuff. But I think that we all have to stand together and say that we're not going to let these women go to jail because someone has a hypothetical, stereotypical attitude about them or their crimes. That's it. I want in this province, some of you will know, it has the dubious distinction of labeling the greatest number of people as dangerous offenders. So Marlene Carter, who some of you have heard about, who was at the Regional Psychiatric Center here, um, they were trying to label her a dangerous offender. The, um, the Crown has decided to appeal that um, non-designation. She was not labeled a dangerous offender. And the view is that the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal is likely to overturn the decision of Judge Whale and not to label her a dangerous offender. And so we'll likely be looking at a Supreme Court of Canada decision. The problem is, since Lisa was labeled a dangerous offender, the, cha the changes to the law that happened actually, um, and some of you may have seen some of this, in November of 2007, we were asked to appear about the, the proposed changes. And we talked about Ashley. We talked about Ashley because According to the provisions that were introduced and that are now law, Ashley could have been labeled a dangerous offender. There were threats to her that that could happen in some of her charges. Now it could because once the application is started, all you have to show is that there are convictions for a certain number of yeah. violent offenses. Uh, it doesn't matter the context, doesn't matter the situation, and increasingly the last two women, um, have the applications have gone on the basis of what they, has happened in prison not in the community. These were provisions developed ostensibly to protect the public from predominantly sex offenders. And now it's being applied willy-nilly and for women, largely on the basis of, of the, uh, the accumulation of charges while they're in prison. You know what I so think is disturbing too is that at my dangerous offender hearing, the first question that Connor asked me is, what do you like, men, women, or both? Tell me how that applies to if I should go to prison for the rest of my life because of my sexuality or are, are you ashamed of your nationality? What I was to say, hi, I'm Lisa, and I'm, I like women, and I'm, you know, like, I'm, I, like, it just makes no sense. And I think that in hearing, instead of calling in a bunch of doctors that say, like, you know, she committed a violent offense, you know, all my offenses except four happened in jail. So technically, I'm a dangerous offender in prison, and I'm fine when I'm on the street. Like, it, it's just, that's how it works out, right? So I'm just saying that I just think for these women that everybody has to come together and say, we're not going to let them do this. You know, women are not, it used to be a sexual predators law for the recidivism rates of sexual offenders. Now you're using it for women who get in fights in bars? Like, it's, it doesn't make sense to me. Sorry. It's, it's, a, it's a scary thought because if you're in a quarantine controlled environment and, and you were to look at a, a prison setting as mice in a box in a maze, and correction services itself is that professor that's standing over it looking into there. They have control and the power of their law, their initiation, their manipulation in it, of them not being able to have the outer law that society has compared to the law that they have within a prison. So if you're saying that they're actually distinguishing them as dangerous offenders while inside of a federal prison, then they damn well should admit that they created it. Yeah. Because she wasn't like that when she went in there. So, but to be orchestrated, wrote off, and all of a sudden, why? Why would someone do that to another human being? Is the ratio, again, mostly Native women? Because when P4W closed and they opened EIFW, when we were fighting for uh, more, uh, I don't know if you want to say better, I guess, yeah, better sustainable lives to live within a prison. When P4W closed, we were in an illusionment when these new prisons were built that they were going to be bigger and better and we wasn't under the, any disillusionment that they wasn't a prison. It was just going to be different. The system was going to be different. So what they did is when you first entered into these new prisons, and they didn't do that in P4W. When you went into P4W, you went and seen a psychiatrist. He asked you like three questions. You seen the medical, you seen the doctor, and then you were given to a cell and you were put in population. That was it. That was your orientation. 
when you went into the new prisons, EIFW and that, they have like a 20, 30, 40 questionnaire, which I call profiling. And so they would turn around and they would profile you. And then if Correction Services Canada got a profile on you, in their diabolical thinking and in my mistrust, I have a feeling that they can pick and choose to turn into whomever they want to, to be whatever they want to. And if they're given the right from the government to do so in the quiet, in the sanctity within that prison, that's horrible. There is a, a justice system and a law within itself. Like, it's horrible to think that they're actually doing that. They wasn't doing that when I was inside. No, that's absolutely right, actually. One of the things, the <coughs> phenomenon that has started in the last couple of decades that we didn't see um, 30 years ago was this accumulation of charges. I mean, the public became most aware of it uh, through the inquest into Ashley's death. The notion that most people, when they first heard, oh, she was doing six and a half years, the presumption was, oh, a young person, she must have done something really bad. I think, um, and thanks to Coralie's courage in ensuring that it, it was live streamed and people got to know the information, it became clear to people, no, 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 that's not what happened. This was an accumulation of charges, criminal charges, what in law we call double jeopardy, really, because the person gets punished inside the prison. Many of them get put in segregation, as Ashley was, as others have been, for extended periods of time, and they get a new criminal conviction and a new sentence. And so that's increasingly what's happened. And a few judges, far too few, in my opinion, a few judges have heard some of that evidence and in a few cases have refused to add time to people's sentences or they've made it concurrent to current sentences. Unfortunately, and this happened in Marlene's case as well, and you may have heard a bit of this yesterday, in Marlene's situation, she pled guilty, and most of the women do plead guilty to this, because to go out in a baby doll, which is basically uh, you know, a big cotton blanket with a hole for your head and a hole for your arms, and often, um, if you're allowed to wear underwear, it's often just un underpants. It's often shoes without any kind of socks in them. It's freezing. You get, then get held in city cells or, and locked in a cage on the way there. You may or may not get fed very palatable food. You get stuck sitting and waiting for court. And inevitably, by the time some of us or our advocates go and see the women, they'll have been encouraged by the staff. And these are not necessarily ill-meaning Ill staff at all. Well, the way to deal with this is if you plead guilty today, it'll be done. And so a number of people plead guilty, go forth. Marlene Carter, when I went back and was preparing to testify in her case, looked at all of her charges, and many of her charges, she had also been committed under mental health legislation. She should not have ever even been held accountable for those. And so it's a phenomenon that um, requires those of us who have access to the prison system, and even those of us, those of you who don't, to know about this and to ask those questions. And I just realized the next panel is waiting to come in. So um, if there are questions, can we ask that you move outside and ask the questions? Because the filmmakers are here who are on in this room next. So I apologize for that. But thank you very thank much, you, you guys. Thank you.